these chair slides are pretty short. That's the note well. Um, you all have seen that, and we can move forward. Um, that should be fairly straightforward. The blue sheets, it's in the Etherpad, the Etherpad link, the correct ones in these slides. It's also in the agenda. Um, we can do the next slide. We have a very short um, agenda. Mostly there's some quick updates on the documents, um, some current working group business, and a couple and a new document coming through. So next slide, Eric. On the document updates, let's go to one more slide. Um, 7626biz, uh, both these um, and the BCP have both sort of been a little slow moving forward, but mostly that's because um, primary office there has been tied up on some personal stuff. So we've been slowly working through that. And there's one outstanding item in 7626biz that she is trying to sort out with the ISG right now. Um, and I believe once that gets done, we'll move that forward. And because that document is um, a normative into the BCP op, we've sort of put the BCP op sort of second, and it's basically ready to go once 7626biz is, is wrapped up. So the two of them will probably slide through right together. And then on the phase two, um, Brian and I have talked recently, and, uh, and I'm going to sit down and spend some time, some extra spare time with um, Alex and Jason and Benno on helping them sort of make sure we get all the issues addressed and see about what we can do about moving forward if it, if actually that needs to be done. Um, so I sent, they, they saw an email from me yesterday. So and then the, then the extra over TLS draft. It's been pretty quiet. There's, they, I think they've addressed most of the outstanding issues. There's a couple of items from Bob Harrell that they haven't addressed. Um, and I'm kind of waiting to see the next version of that from the author. So that's a little slight hint to sort of get them to move along. Next slide, Eric. And I think that's, I think there's one before that, but mostly um, there's three things on the agenda. The DNS over quick discussion with Christian, who's next, the deprived early data document, which is very short. Um, and I mean, we're very curious if, if there's some, you know, we think it's useful and we have some interesting, Brian and I have some discussions about that. And then Daniel got something to sort of entertain us at the end on signaling fees during policies. Uh, so with that, um, if we can bring up Christian slides and we can get right to Christian and get things going. So thanks for being patient folks. And like Brian said, we'll, we don't think we'll take the full 90 minutes, but we're not going to rush through anything. So thanks a lot. Christian. Thanks, Tim. So uh, I am going to present the draft. We have been working on the DNS over quick. We did work on that draft uh, off and on for the last two years in the quick working group. And I just resubmitted it in the deprived working group because of what we'll see next. So, how do I change the slide? Uh, is that the first slide? No, 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 no. Yes. Okay, so what I was speaking about, what we want to define is a very simple mapping of DNS over a quick connection that just does DNS and nothing else. And the, the principle of the mapping are straightforward. I mean, we use the quick stream to uh, isolate connections, so isolate uh, queries and responses. So each query opens a stream and the response come on the same stream and then the stream is closed. We will have a 64K size limit on each query to be compatible with uh, DNS over TCP. There is a specification of parallel processing, so there is no head of queue blocking. And that's also a feature of quick and the difference with TCP is that if there are several, uh, several queries in progress and one of the packet carrying one of the queries is lost, in TCP, you will get head of queue blocking, you will have to wait until that uh, missing packet has been corrected to process all the other packets. With Quick, you don't have to do that. The first uh, target of the draft is the stop to recursive scenario. The main reason for that is that we 
cannot really address recursive to autoreductive without having a way to discover the servers. I mean, if we don't have, uh, if the, the recursive don't know with certainty that this server suppose, supports DNS over quick, then they are going to do a dance of trying and then failing and then failing over to DNS over UDP or DNS over DLS. And that will be just a waste of time. So the real reason to not do stuff to recursive in quick right now is because we are waiting for the discovery. DNS over quick operates on a dedicated port, which is to be allocated by IANA. It's not defined yet. Next slide. You. So, to give you an idea how it works, I mean, Quick is a fairly lightweight protocol, but still, what Quick does is embed a TLS to negotiate the encryption keys yeah. for the Quick connection. So, if you see a, a basic Quick connection, you will see an initial packet that carries the client hello, which is the, the first TLS packet. And you will see a series of UDP packets coming from the server, carrying the uh, server hello in TLS and then carrying all the TLS extensions. They will be uh, using a basic encryption key, which is really just uh, for uh, verification of the packet for the initial packets that are not really not encrypted. And then the encryption key derived from the client hello and server hello for the end check packets, which carries all the TLS extensions. In particular, they carry the certificates, and so we have all the properties there of TLS 1.2. Once the client receives that, it gets the uh, what we call the one RTT key, which are basically the, the data encryption key for the data session. The client sends an end check confirmation and then uh, sends a one RTT packet, which is the uh, which carries a DNS query. The, uh, there is only one single arrow there because uh, Quick has a feature called um, packet coalescing, and those this TLS packet and the data packet are sent in the same UDP data. After that, well, you get the uh, response from the server, which will carry also a bunch of ancillary TLS things like the handshake done, an indication, a session ticket, maybe an acknowledgement, and the DNS response, and you will get a one RTT acknowledgement coming back. And the session will then be ready so that if there is another query, another query it can be sent immediately on the query, and it will repeat what we've seen. The, we sent and the response is received. And in fact, oh, okay, I get, I get feedback on Jabber that I'm not clear. I mean, uh, can I? I'll try to speak more slowly and see what that means. So, if you see this uh, first connection, uh, we have a one RTT overhead to set up the TLS connection and exchange the encryption key. And then all the DNS queries and response are basically one datagram out, one datagram response coming back, and maybe uh, an acknowledgement after that. There are all kinds of optimization in Quick so that basically acknowledgement can be carried in data packet, etc. Next slide. This. So, one thing we specify in the draft is the handling of connection. And the handling of connection relies heavily on the fact that you can resume connection very quickly with Quick. So, we don't have the same kind of penalty that we have in uh, TCP. You have to reset the connection and, and restart everything again. In Quick, because you have this zero RTT series, what you can do is that if the connection has been idle for some time and the recursive doesn't know whether the, um, the 
the server has dropped the connection or not, the recursive can simply start a new connection and it could use ZeroRTT to send the DNS query together with the uh, TLS request. And the server similarly could send the uh, TLS responses and coalesce with that the DNS response. So basically what we say is that if we restart the connection by opposition to starting the connection from zero, the response can come immediately without waiting with an additional delay. And that's very useful for uh, connection handling because that means that uh, servers can have a pool of connections, but they don't have to have that pool be very large. I mean, uh, the, uh, the servers and the recursive can drop a connection of say something like 20 seconds and there are very little penalty doing that because it doesn't impede, I mean, the, it doesn't create new delays for the connection. Uh, next slide, please. What happens in either case when you have additional queries? I mean, additional queries can be sent at any time by the client. There is a mechanism in Quick to exercise flow control. So if the server wants to, it can limit the number of queries that the client can send on a connection and, and do flow control to limit that, but I'm not showing that here. Basically, I'm seeing here a client sending two queries in two separate streams, stream four and stream eight, and the server sending back the responses in stream eight and stream four. This illustrates the fact that uh, the response don't have to be sent in order. If the response were ready at the same time, they could fly in the same DB packet. was basically a set of ladder diagrams to explain uh, how that works. Next slide, please. Now the question is, why do we want to have this uh, DNS over quick specification? And I show here how DNS over quick differs from DNS over TLS and from DNS over HTTP. Uh, DNS over HTTP 3 is effectively the same specification as DNS over HTTP 2. There is no radical difference. So what works with uh, DNS over HTTP 2 will work in the same way with DNS over HTTP 3 and using quick instead of TCP and TLS. There is a lot of similarity between DNS over quick and DNS over HTTP 3. The main difference being that we don't have the uh, HTTP 3 layer. And so on one hand for DNS or HTTP 3 that gives to DNS or HTTP 3 an integration with the web, but uh, it also brings all the uh, web implementation into the protocol, which at the minimum increase the complexity. DNS over quick, does not need the HTTP net, net layer and doesn't have a dependency on the HTTP platform, which makes it a more compact implementation. The advantage of our uh, DNS over, T, over TLS is that uh, we use quick instead of TLS and TCP. So we have all these benefits of uh, having uh, one RTT establishment or zero RTT. We often hear discussion about uh, whether these solutions can cross firewalls or not. Well, in truth, any of those could cross the firewalls if you mix it with uh, encrypted SNI and or encrypted client hello that are being defined in the TLS working group. So I'm, I'm not going to dwell into firewall traversal there. And uh, pretty much the end of my presentation. Next slide, please. Now, we started working on this, as I said, a couple of years ago. And the reason we did not progress is that 
the quick transport was very much in flux years ago. It is pretty much ready now. The spec is largely frozen. Most of the changes that we see are clarification on the specification, basically final touches. There are more than 16 interpreting implementations of the quick transport, and there are interrupt events scheduled regularly. So that means that the quick transport is now stable, and we can work on a protocol on top of quick outside of the quick working group. DNS over quick does not require changes in quick, at least in the quick transport. It defines a new implementation on top. And there is no requirement on the quick working group except to have the spec as it is. There is some work to do in deep dive, specifically on connection management, on the details of the DNS packet mapping, things like uh, what to do with eDNS, what to do with packet size, what to do with packet IDs. There are specifications in the draft. We'll get a better specification with the next version because we got some feedback. There is also uh, a point about using zero RTT. As I said, zero RTT is great for performance, but uh, we have to mitigate privacy issues and the security issues in event with zero RTT. So we'll work on that. And uh, we have a presentation later on zero RTT. So we'll listen to that too. But basically my take is that at that point, the draft is in a sufficiently good shape and the quick transport is sufficiently stable that we can start working on that in the deep drive working group. And my question in the next slide, Should the working group adopt that as a work item? And now I'll stop and listen for questions. Thanks, Christian. Um, first one in the in the queue is uh, is Ecker. Hi, Eric Pascrola. Um, yeah, I'm sort of neutral on adopting this. Um, I, I, I think you're making an like, incredibly persuasive case for why we don't just do DNS over HTTP three. But like, I'm not going to lie on the road over it. Um, uh, I have two sort of technical comments. Um, uh, you said this um, needs uh, um, uh, its, its own port. Um, I certainly see why it needs its own port as opposed to um, port 53, but it's not clear to me why it can't run in, in, on, um, on UDP 443 because the LPM lets you demux those. Um, and um, you know, generally, I think that you know, LPMs are much more flexible mechanism than, than the port numbers. Um, uh, and secondly, on this um, on this question about um, uh, uh, ESNI, um, uh, um, echo and ALPN filtering, um, you know, while I'm a huge fan of, of echo, um, I think it's quite probable that a large number of, um, uh, of, uh, environments will basically ban echo and we'll do that by suppressing, um, uh, we'll do that by suppressing the DNS queries you need to retrieve echo. Um, and, um, so in those cases, um, uh, DO3 will, will get through the firewall much better than on DOQ. Thank you. Thank you, Iker. Uh, well, what you say is correct. I mean, uh, if we are uh, in the business of uh, designing the best firewall to ever sold, then a DDK port is not what you want to do. At the same time, uh, what you said about uh, DNS over quick could just as well be said about DNS over DLS. It's uh, exactly the same. Reason. I agree. And so, I mean, I, I don't think there is there is a new debate here. It's it's a it's an issue. On one hand, using a DT ticket port makes it easier for the network managers to see what's happening. On the other hand, uh, Running of our port 43 and running uh, as much like HTTP as you want makes it easier to sneak out from a network that might be somewhat hostile. So yeah, I mean there are there are two designs, and I will just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Jim Reed. Thanks, guys. 
Uh, Christian, I think this is a good idea and I support working with adoption. I'm just curious, the draft mentions that the DNS query ID must be set to zero. Could you please explain the rationale for that? It doesn't seem sensible to me. Thanks. Well, the rationale is that you have to be clear what you're demuxing on. So if you are demuxing on the stream, on the stream number, you don't want to be also demuxing on the uh, query ID. And, and making the query ID zero makes that crystal clear. Also, wise, you get an initial layer. I mean, you get an initial layer of complexity either way, but zero appears simpler. Now, that's the kind of stuff that we can definitely discuss in the working group and, and change in the draft in a later version if there is consensus in the working group also. All right, uh, next up is uh, Ben Schwartz. Hi, Ben Schwartz here. Um, to Jim's point, I, I'll just mention that Do uh, does the same thing, sets the query ID to zero. Uh, I wanted to say something um, somewhat similar to what Ecker said, uh, but also a little different, I think, that Echo does not apply, at least as currently specified, to DNS transports because uh, DNS transports uh, are the thing that you use to get your DNS queries, but Echo requires you to be able to perform a DNS query before you can use it. So, uh, if especially if use cases that uh, don't have a bootstrap resolver are in scope, for example, cases where I say, okay, here's my DNS over quick server, and here's its uh, the name that you should validate, and here's the IP address, then uh, you should, uh, you, you can connect directly, but you can't do echo. Uh, overall, my, my thought on this is that this all seems like it will absolutely work, and it has some, some very small performance advantage over DNS over HTTPS. I think for client use cases, it's not really very interesting. For client recursive, I think it's potentially much more interesting for recursive to authoritative, where the performance differences might be more meaningful. Well, yes. And uh, uh, it's indeed, I mean, uh, when I was looking at that, my personal inclination was to design it for the uh, Perceive to authoritative case, but as I said, we can only do that after we have solved the discovery issues. I'm done. I don't hear any response. Okay, ben, do you hear me now? We can hear you, Christian. Okay, so so I think Ben is correct. I mean, there are, first on, on the um, ESNI eco point. I, I don't want to handle uh, the use of ESNI or uh, firewall torso issues in this draft. I think that that belongs to uh, deployment considerations and uh, they will come either way. But uh, for, the, um, for the recursive case, I do agree with Ben that uh, DNS over quick make a lot of sense for the uh, recursive to uh, authoritative case, because first, we don't have the firewall problems in any case. Second, it makes a lot of sense to have a lightweight protocol in that environment, if only because a lightweight protocol has a much smaller attack surface, which is a consideration. That's uh, what motivates me most. But then uh, we have to get experience, and it's much easier to get experience in the uh, in the stub to recursive mode because you can always configure the stub to use exactly this recursive with that protocol. So that's the reason we start with the stub. I agree with Ben. We will have to work on the uh, recursive to authoritative scenario. Let's do that later. Okay, and Ted Hardy. 
Thanks. This is Seth Hardy speaking. Uh, <clears throat> first, I'm strongly in favor of supporting uh, adoption. I think that uh, this is a, a very good use of, of Quick, and I think that uh, it, it will get um, uh, deployment in, in some of the use cases that we're currently seeing uh, DNS over uh, TLS or DNS over DTLS suggested um, because it has the head of line blocking avoidance uh, that uh, Christian outlined. Uh, which I think is is a very useful uh, performance improvement over DT, uh, DOT or DO, uh, DTLS. I, I also agree with Christian uh, that there there is an advantage here for an, an eventual um, uh, recursive to authoritative, especially with zero RTT, um, the ability to to go back to an authoritative and get fresh data is is clearly going to be uh, very useful. But I think the head of line blocking. Uh, problem in the stub to recursive is is actually one that this will improve a good bit, um, simply because you'll you'll end up in situations where you get uh, a resource, say a web page, and you want to do all the DNS lookups in it at once. And I think uh, Quick is a very useful uh, way of approaching that. I I understand people may want to do DOH over Quick as well. Um, I don't think that that's uh, something that. This group needs to to take up or block. It's already sort of handled by the fact that uh, two different versions of HTTP are available. Um, but I do think that the the caching semantics are are significantly similar, uh, simpler. Sorry, uh, in this, and I, I personally think that that means uh, we we should take up the work and and then have the discussions of things like what port numbers are, um, uh, et cetera, in in the working group. Thanks, Ted uh, and Christian. Uh, so Tim and I are going to take an action item to actually start a working group uh, adoption call for this. <clears throat> so that sh you should see that on the mailing list in the next day or so. So please chime in on on your support or objections to to us taking this work on. If there are no other questions, we're going to move on to uh, Alessandro and the uh, early data over uh, TLS. Oh, uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, hello, I'm Alessandro. I'm going to give a quick update on the using early data in DNS over TLS draft. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, a quick recap first. Um, TLS 1.3 introduced a feature called ZRTT session resumption which allows a client to send application data in the first round trip of the handshake, this data being called early data. Um, it can be used by DNS over TLS clients to send DNS queries to a DNS over TLS server without having to wait for the handshake to complete. And it can be useful in cases where maintaining uh, a long-lived connection to a DNS server is not feasible, for example, a mobile client um, connected to unstable network, uh, the TLS connection to a server might need to be re-established often. Or in the case of a uh, resolver to authoritative server, um, the resolver might decide to drop some connections um, that are maybe not used often. And then using ZRTT, they can um, reduce the cost of having to re-establish the connection. Uh, next slide. Uh, there are some caveats to the use of zero RTT and early data, uh, most notably the fact that early data can be intercepted by on-path attackers and it can be replayed by said attackers to the server. So um, if the early data has, uh, causes side effects to the TLS and DNS server, um, an attacker might be able to exploit this um, by replaying data uh, to the server multiple times. For this reason, um, application protocols that want to use zero RTT and early data need to define a policy for when it is safe to do so. And that's what this document is trying to do. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, the draft was originally presented at ITF 105 and it already went through 
a couple of rounds of discussion on the mailing list. So I'm going to present some of the changes that came out of those. Next slide. Um, one of the main complaints from reviewers was that the language around which DNS messages should be allowed in early data and which should not be allowed was not um, was not very clear and it could be improved. So, for example, the original draft said something like DNS updates and zone transfer messages cannot be sent over early data. Uh, the new version of the draft, however, says that only DNS messages with a query opcode are allowed. So that also um, removes other edge cases and other cases that were not previously considered. In addition to that, uh, the new draft version also defines a whitelist of RR types that can be used within query messages within early data. Uh, the, the whitelist is defined as a, a, an IANA registry, so it can be expanded later on. Um, however, the list is not complete. Uh, there's a lot of RR types that are currently defined, and I do not know what most of them do. So uh, I only added a few entries to the list, but if the draft ends up being adopted, we will need to discuss which additional RR types need to be added to the list. And then there were a bunch of other uh, editorial changes to clarify language uh, that reviewers reported. Next slide, please. So uh, having said that, um, I'm not 100% sure we actually need the RR type uh, whitelist. And um, it might be that only restricting on the query opcode is enough to uh, achieve the goal here, which is only allow DNS messages that are even potent. Um, again, I don't know what a lot of the RR types defined do, so it, this might use some input from people with more DNS experience. And then uh, if we decide that the list needs to remain, we will need to discuss which are our types to add. Next slide. So uh, I guess the question now is whether the working group is interested in this work and whether it should be uh, adopted. Uh, any questions? All right, it looks like we have a, a one on Ben's here. So uh, first in the queue is Ben Schwartz. I support adoption, and I don't think we need a list. Okay. And Ben must be invoked thrice, Kadek. This is Ben Kadek. Um, I had a couple points. One is that I think that having the whitelist is basically what we had in mind when we were writing 8446. And I know Eckers on the call, so he can disagree if he wants to. Um, but I think that it's reasonable to have the whitelist both for the, the query opcode and the specific R types, even if we end up allowing most of the R types. Uh, and then my second point was regarding the description of the zero RTT data uh, requests as needing to be item potent. I think it's actually a little bit stronger of a condition than that, because item potent we usually think of as just sort of uh, relating to the same query. Uh, being reordered or reapplied with itself. But I think we actually need a stronger criterion that the query has the same results and the same side effect when reordered with other queries that might be happening uh, or other events that might be happening on the server, which doesn't necessarily seem like a problem off the top of my head, but I just wanted to point out that it is a stronger condition we have to consider. E, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I'm not quite sure what the language in the draft is right now. Um, so if it needs to be clarified, I'm happy to do that. I uh, think it does need to be clarified a little bit. Okay. And a question from Christian. Yes, well, it's, uh, it's an interesting draft, but uh, I think that it misses one of the points that uh, DKG has been making about of zero RTT. The problem of replaying zero RTT is that if 
a client sends a request in ZeroRTP, an adversary can copy that and repeat it later and look at the side effects of that request at the server. For example, does the request triggers a query from the server to a specific name server on the other side? And I, I am not sure. I didn't see that in Alessandro's presentation. I didn't see this uh, issue of side effects and how side effects can be privacy leaks. And I think that should be uh, discussed. And the best way would be to uh, go to uh, DKG's original analysis and incorporate it in the draft. Apart from that, uh, yes, I do support adoption because uh, that's what I suggested is exactly the kind of thing that we should do in the working group after adoption. Right, so to, to the point of DKG's analysis, uh, the draft already includes uh, some uh, security considerations around uh, at least one specific attack that was identified in a discussion from, I think, was a year ago or a couple years ago. Uh, from the discussion with the DKG. And um, it might be that we also need to add something around, for example, caching. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm happy to, to add some language there or accept PRs to, to add that. Thanks, Alessandro. Um, you know, much like the, the, the first draft, uh, Tim and I are going to craft a uh, call for adoption, and we encourage everyone to voice their opinion of support or disagreement with uh, taking on this kind of work. Uh, so right before we move on to our third presentation from Daniel, I just want to encourage everybody who's not signed the blue sheet uh, to go to the Etherpad and sign the blue sheet. Uh, so next is going to be Daniel. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, good. So this presentation is going to be about signaling resolvers of filtering policies. So next slide. So the, the motivation for um, these mechanisms is that um, currently filtering policies implemented by the resolver uh, seems an important uh, things to know in order to proceed to a potential selection uh, of a resolver. And currently filtering is, a, is um, clearly associated to parental control and uh, it's being performed through a canary domain. And so the main motivation for this um, presentation and document is to have a standard mechanism so that um, we can have an explicit um, announcement from um, from a, a resolver to a client to say, these are the filtering policy I'm implementing, as well as um, a standardized uh, mechanism for a client to request a resolver, which are the uh, filtering um, policies enforced. Next slide. So, because either the, the resolver should be able to inform the DNS client and the DNS client should be able to request a resolver, we get two kind of different mechanisms. So one that's a good, where the resolver can inform the DNS client and another one when the DNS client in, in relation with the resolver and request which are the filtering policy put in place. Next slide. So communications between a DNS client and a resolver um, have already some history. And um, in, uh, in our case, we are largely inspired by um, the communication of a trust anchor. So it's somehow different. So. Um, we're using a eDNS zero as well as a specific DNS query. Next slide. So, 
So, um, so how do we represent the filtering policies? So in this case, we represent them through a datagram that we designated the data. And the resolver is um, advertising the filtering policy by carrying this data through an eDNS zero record. And um, when the client is willing to request to that resolver, um, this data is going to be carried through, um, are going to be associated to a special, special FQDN. Next slide. So here is basically how the data is um, is, um, is built. So it's it's bit, we basically define some um, some filtering categories, and the, the the full filtering policies is an aggregation of those um, filtering policies, uh, which assumes that um, in this case it's um, an addition of all of those. Um, I mean the 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 names. So the names of the filtering policies are not, um, I mean, have to be standard defined um, through the AINA. Only provided a, um, some examples. Of course, we can in, increase those, but um, the idea is to remain quite simple and um, not to have um, billions of uh, combinations. Next slide. So when you advertise those, I mean, this data is being carried through um, um, eDNS zero options. Next slide. And when DNS resolver wants to actually check um, which policies are being enforced by the resolver, so he sends a specific um, uh, request. Um, so what is important is that Q type is set to null, and uh, the filtering policy and and the Q name is set to underscore filtering policies dot example dot com, where example dot com is the domain name to the FQDN of the resolver. So in some cases, um, the application is uh, may only know the IP address, in which case um, a reverse resolution might be uh, needed. To derive the, the domain. Next slide. So, I mean, um, there are some um, some point of discussions probably. So, um, in, I mean, that's worth being mentioned. Um, EDNS zero is is not protected uh, via DNS. So um, might um, be considered. So when the server is advertising the filtering policies, in in this case, the, using these mechanisms, we would not be able to protect that um, using DNSSEC. Why, when the client is um, requesting that, um, I mean the D DNSSEC can be used. Um, and there is also the case of um, when I have um, a resolver that is depending on different upstream resolvers. So uh, pr probably all these um, filtering policies should be aggregated and provided to the uh, DNS client. Um, other things is that um, such mechanisms might assume that we have um, one policy per FQDN, so per resolver, um, which is a little bit different from um, a situation where um, different policies are made available by one resolver to a DNS client. So um, this is um, one aspect of it. And um, maybe an, another consideration is that whether we should support different um, characteristics of the filtering policies or sh should we only advertise we, we are filtering. It's a binary Boolean values, truth or not. So, well, um, I leave the floor uh, open to any suggestions um, and comment. 
It looks like we got a couple of questions. Uh, first up is Alex. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I think it's it's actually an interesting idea. Um, I see actually two problems with that. One thing is with the with the table of the possible filtering descriptions. I mean, illegal uh, caused me to cringe a little bit because illegal depends on the on the jurisdiction. Is that the jurisdiction of the server? Is that the jurisdiction of the client? So there's all kind of uh, complications to that to that very table. So I think that table is really opening the can of worms. I, I don't have a suggestion how to improve that though. Um, so I think the question is also, do we want to have a really specific indication of which what, what each category means, or do we have like a rough indication of what categories the name server is uh, attacking? And the second one is, um, I don't really like the solution with the with the queue name of uh, using the domain name of the resolver. So I don't have a solution to that at the moment, but um, I don't think it's very elegant, particularly because of the reverse uh, resolving of the resolver name. And then you need to identify what is actually the domain name of the resolver. Do we want to apply the uh, the public suffix list to that name after we have reverse look up, looked looked up, and so on and so forth? So, so these are the two uh, things that I think we need more work on. Okay, so. Um... Well, thank you for the suggestion. Um, yeah, so I agree with you that um, if we have to define some categories, uh, we might go into um, some, uh, unnecessary debates. Um, so yeah, so the, the, this is actually something I'd like to, under, to, to know um, whether people are more in favor of having um, some of those categories or none of those, um, we may simply add a filtering is present. Um, I'm fine either ways. Um, yeah, so that's um, it's um, something something that um, needs to be discussed and um, agreed. Um, I don't have a strong feeling going into one or the other directions um, either. Also. Um, regarding the other one, um, um, having a special domain name. So what I came to also is um, um, if only the, the problem could is um, is due to the reverse resolution. Um, we could also agree maybe on a, um, on a very special name um, like a. We have an um, unspecified um, name like uh, um, home.harpa um, that are not um, um, valid outside um, the home network. So we could have uh, maybe uh, similar names that won't be um, valid outside the end resolver. So maybe we can come with those um, things. But uh, so what I don't know is that is that the pro problem due to the reverse resolution or um, you don't want uh, this to be addressed through a DNS exchange? Quick response. No, I think it's okay to address this to a, through a DNS exchange, the filtering policies itself, but I think that the, 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 the discovery of the domain of the resolver is, an, is a step that's not necessary anywhere else. So if we can come up with some um, name or whatever um, okay then that would be preferred because I think it needs to be the, the client needs to do this once just because to discover the filtering policy so it would be much easier if we could agree on a, like an IANA registered name for that and uh, that opens up another can of worms but that's a different story okay yeah, yeah. okay so I see your point um, another thing that was also being mentioned is that um, if we have a service I mean a resolver discovery protocol, it's also something you could learn uh, this way. For example, if you were using a um, SVC B um, record, uh, you could have that as an um, a key a key parameter, a key value um, 
that specified those data also. So that's um, another way to to discover that, which is complementary to um, the mechanism described here, I think. So thank you. Maybe we can go next, unless you have something to add. Thank you. All right, next in the queue is uh, Eric Mascorla. Hi, hey, Daniel. Um, Hi. So uh, I guess my question is, um, do you know of anyone who wants to consume this information? In this form, needs to... do you know? Do you know? Do you, do you, do you know of any client which wants to consume this information? So one of those client could be um, the, the client using the um, um, the Canary domain. Yeah. And, um, so but yeah, I guess my question is: Have you talked to anybody who's doing one of the Canary domains um, and wants to do this? So the the, the people I talked to were. The people setting the canary domains. I, I understand, but 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 that the relevant question is who would wish like is is who wish is the people who are who are looking at the canary domain want to look at it this way? Yeah, that's a, so uh, that's why I'm waiting for your comment. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so I mean, <laughs> so it seems to me that there are two things that make this proposal not like super awesome for me. Um, the first is that. Um, Having it stuffed in like EDNS zero means that I have to go figure out whether like the operating system resolver will let me get this information. And the nice thing at the Canary domain or something like it is that I can like guarantee do it with like the queries that I can actually make out of the operating system resolver for basically any operating system. And that's like a pretty hard requirement because otherwise it if on my my own resolver. So Pretty much, it has to be the case that if you can't like get this information by doing like get adder or some other thing that every operating system has, it's like kind of an uncertain for me. Um, the second is that um, this sort of detailed information about what kind of filtering policy um, seems to create like a lot of confusion and ambiguity that doesn't actually help me very much because um, the only thing I'm really interested in um, and, and, and is there policy enforcement on this resolver or not? Um, because like it's just too hard to explain to the user. Well, here is like some like kind of ambiguous set of policies which you have to like, um, you know, which somehow maybe you want this, maybe you don't. Okay, so um, let me rephrase that. So, I, I mean, um, I, I heard some um, cut during the, the response. So, um, you don't you don't think have um, um, the filtering policies is a good thing? It's, it's more confusing than anything else. Uh, yeah, I just don't know what I'm going to tell the user. Like. I mean, okay. so, I mean, so I mean, bear in mind, bear in mind that like what Firefox does now when it sees the canary domain is just silently like, disables Do. Um, you know, we've talked about having it be um, like, you know, we've been told to disable Do. Could be we, we, we disable like flagging it to the user, but like I just don't think we flagged the user. It's been it's been flagged because of like these three different filtering policies, which ostensibly your network enforces. Okay, so um, that's fine. And um, the other point is that um, EDNS zero is that. I mean, you, you don't like because because of middle box that could strip the EDNS zero. Uh, no, um, I, I is will the operating system um, resolver interface let me get it? Okay, like basically, basically understand that like Firefox does not have its own Do fifty three resolver. Um, it just uses the um, it just uses the uh, uh, um, you know the, the operating system resolver. Um, I think Chrome has its own Do fifty three resolver, um, but not everybody does, and so. Um, in that case, you want you want it to be able to be something you can do with an operating system call rather than rather than be something you have to say you can't. And I don't. And my impression is this data is not available to me on every operating system, or in fact, maybe any operating system. Right, so yeah, if, if um, at least on one operating system, if you can't have access to that information, it's, um, I mean, um, you, you won't be able to use that. So that's correct. Um, in which case, I mean, for you, so would you suggest that we only focus on a client requesting and not the EDNS options? Um, yeah, I think, as I said, useful I, for. I think those that can have access to. Right. I, I think I, I I guess I would want to do one thing, not several. And um 
And so I'm going to want to do things that I say that I can get the uh, existing operating system APIs. So basically limit the scope to um, only having this DNS exchange, not with the option. As I say, the requirement is that it has to work with like get adder, you know, get, 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 you know, the existing OS APIs. That's the, that's the underlying requirement. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I'm fine uh, to implement, um, I mean, uh, to update the document with um, your inputs. Um, well, yeah, we'll need, so yeah, I'm fine with, with that. I mean, it, it makes sense to me. Okay, uh, next in the queue is Chris Box. Hello, uh, yeah, it's Chris. Um, so I can see that the idea of learning filtering policies is useful. Um, so right now we have Cloudflare offering specific IP addresses for different filtering sets. So 1112 for malware, uh, 1113 for the combination of malware with parental filtering. Um, so when I walk into a hotel and connect to the Wi-Fi, it, it may be useful to learn what's happening um, in that resolver. Um, so my question is, could you clarify how you see this relating to ADD? Because uh, I think you said it was complementary. Um, and to my mind, ADD is charged with um, solving the problem of how you discover which resolvers are available and, and selecting from them. And as part of the selection process, you might want to learn these filtering policies. So how, how do you see that sitting? So, yeah, it's... Um... It's a, it's a good question. Um, I think at that point, um, so I mean, the same information could be disclosed through um, um, a, a specific discovery protocol. Um, but um, it, it might not be available through that way. And so um, if you're connected to one server, you want to to know um, whether this, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a different way to discover that, uh, I would tend to say, but um, I mean, uh, suppose we have a, a lot of different um, 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 things to, to discover, we, we won't be able to add those, all those, all those keys to um, um, SVCB um, record, for example. So if you're connected to one resolver and you want maybe specifically know what, whether he's, he's uh, implementing some filtering, um, if this resolver is not implementing the service discovery, the resolver discovery protocol, so that's, um, I, I, this is why I would mention that as complementary. Okay, thank you. Uh, next in the queue is Vittorio. Okay. I, um, well, personally, I think I, I'd find something like this useful, but I uh, agree with Iker. I mean, in the end, this is useful only if, if there are clients that want to implement it. So I think that that's the first thing we, we should understand. And same for the level of detail in discovering the policy, but I think that if you want to be detailed, it will need to be more than that than what you have now. But then I too complex for, I mean, basically being useful. So perhaps this should be done in two steps. So first, maybe we should agree on the functional requirements. So which kind of information we need to communicate and then start by shedding on how, how do you fit this data into a DNS communication. And finally, the, I mean, I also had this, this issue about where, where does this fit better if it's more like ADD draft. I mean, I know that there's another draft there that already does something like this, I think. And this looks uh, more like, I mean, fitting the second point in the ADD charter. So I, I don't have any strong view, I'm fine with whatever, but uh, at least we should make sure that all the work related to these kind of things go, goes in, into a specific working group. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, depending, um, so, I, 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 well, Given all the feedback, I, I think everyone agrees that um, we should not have a detailed uh, filtering policy. So that's my first um, uh, conclusion of 
all the things I come at, uh, receive. Um, and I'm fine with that. Now, um, related to the, I mean, the relations between ADD, I mean, this work, I mean, if this work could have been hosted in ADD, um, I agree it could have been hosted. I mean, on my point of view, it could have been hosted, but uh, um, uh, we discussed with the chair and um, the ADD chair said, um, deprived is, is more appropriate for that. So that's what the reason is um, in deprived. Now, um, anything I was mentioning, um, could it be discovered uh, through um, a discovery protocol provided in ADD? My answer is yes. Um, we can still have a SVC key parameters saying um, filtering true or not, and that could be advertised. But um, so it's a different way to advertise a parameter um, outside a, a service discovery protocol. Um, so, so yeah, that's uh, what uh, I meant. And um, yeah, so um, I don't think it's uh, conflictual at that point. Um, but um, it's um, yeah, we should not have a Overlaps, or if we think it's uh, conflictual. Okay, uh, next in Ben Schwartz. Hi, this is Ben Schwartz. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with some previous commenters that this kind of work should not be in deprived. This is not a privacy enhancement for DNS. Uh, it's also clearly overlaps with some work that's ongoing in ADD. And, uh, you know, if it if it wasn't included there, then maybe that uh, reflects a, a lack of space in ADD for additional work. And maybe this needs to be combined with the existing proposals on this topic. Uh, another reason that I think we need to be uh, combining it is because I do not want us to end up with a separate discovery mechanism for every aspect of metadata about the user's resolver or resolution path. We need a unified metadata scheme. So we can't invent uh, information discovery mechanisms for each piece of information we'd like to learn. We need a general information discovery mechanism. And uh, lastly, on the particular kind of information that is proposed to be discovered here, I want to point out that, in my view, this is an evil bit which is to say that it is a, a claim made by one party in the protocol that the other party is somehow being expected to use but cannot verify. Uh, and that actually makes it very different from the canary domain where the thing that the client checks is uh, it measures a behavior of its resolver and uh, so, in effect, it verifies the property that it is uh, attempting to measure. So, um, so the first comment, um, whether it should be only, well, I understand that the first comment is uh, that we should not have a, a specific discovery mechanisms outside the resolver discovery mechanisms. Um, so, I don't know if it's um, if it's um, it's a valid comment. Um, if um, people agree this way, I'm fine with that. Um, it's not obvious that um, every everyone is going to configure and to adhere to the discovery um, mechanisms. Also, so that's the thing I'd like to nuance. And this is a uh, something that could be immediately. Uh, actionable. Um, it could. Um, I mean, and we have all the things. Um, like, for ex if you want to know which um, um, KSK is being used um, by the resolver, is that something that should be discovered by the DNS client, or uh, should it be advertised to um, generate uh, resolver discovery protocol? So. I'm not sure that um, I, I do somehow share your point, but uh, I'm not sure it's um, we, could, we we can have a, a single mechanism for um, everything. So 
So I, I, in case that wasn't clear, this is Ben Schwartz. I just want to clarify that I'm not saying that this all needs to be rolled into the mechanism by which you learn of the existence of a resolver, but rather that okay. all of the metadata about a resolver that you might want to know should be discovered through a single mechanism, other or at least a, a unified framework. Otherwise, we end up with a a novel metadata discovery mechanism for every piece of metadata that we intend to learn. Okay, so just to clarify, um, you would like um, um, underscore metadata so that we got all of those data data instead of having underscore metadata one, underscore metadata two, and so on. Yeah, so in particular, the DNS op working group already has an adopted draft called the resolver info uh, RR type res info, which proposes a unified framework for learning metadata about a resolver. Uh, I don't know that that draft is the final uh, perfect answer to this problem, but that's the architecture that I think we should be aiming for. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, correct. Um, I, if you could point this exact draft, it would be helpful. But um, this is also something I, uh, I thought that that if we define something, it could be extended to. It should not be only about um, filtering um, services, but it could be extended to um, other uh, future um, 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 functionalities. So I agree with that. Um, now, I, I, I think you mentioned that um, you you wanted this to be uh, part of um, ADD instead of this uh, deprived. I I mean, to me, I'm I I don't care uh, which working group it is. Um, it has been decided. Uh, it has been deprived. Uh, I mean, it it was mostly the ADD chairs that uh, preferred this to be. Uh, uh, Hosted by deprive, so I mean, for me, I'm equal regarding the the where wherever it's being hosted. Okay, and this is Eric Vink here, the responsible AD for the group. I also believe that this document is not really fitting the deprive uh, charter. I, 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 it's, um, I can, um, but so, so, well, the thing is, um, what I'd like to clarify is, um, I'm fine sending that to, um, ADD, but, um, I mean, uh, do we think it has no places, no working group, or do we think ADD is the right place? So Daniel, I think the uh, the right answer here is is I think first of all to go off and uh, and maybe take a look at what that DNS off resolver info draft says and whether or not you could actually incorporate the information that you have in your document into that framework. And then I think once once that is figured out, then we can we can talk between the the work group chairs and and the, and the uh, area directors to see where it actually makes sense to do the work. Thanks, Brian. Brian, this is Barry Lieber, responsible AD for ADD. Um, remember, the ADD has a very tight, tightly scoped charter right now, and that I've given the, I've asked the cha the chairs to be very selective about what they accept. To start off small, it may be Daniel that what you're proposing makes sense to go into ADD later, and it may just make sense that right now we need to hold off. But Brian's suggestion is the way to approach it right now. And Daniel, this is Tim. I put the link to the resolver info draft in the WebEx chat. And um, there is, I agree with one thing Ben said that I think we really need to take forward is we need a common framework, a unifying metadata framework. And I think that, you know, a lot of the, the drafts that I see like this are very interesting, but they all have their own way of sort of solving the same problem. And and I think Puneet and Paul have a draft that, um, if you take a look at it, hopefully can fit, you know, what you're doing, or maybe it can be extended, right? The whole goal of that one is to make something you can 
you know, put your own metadata into. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this would be yeah. even better. Totally encourage everybody to take a look at that. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. All right, so let's move on through the queue. Uh, Eric Klein is next. Eric. All right, we'll see if he can circle back around. Um, next up is uh, Benno. Hi, <laughs> query from the Jabber room. Uh, question. Uh, so one of the questions was already uh, answered in the previous uh, discussion. So one still open is uh, why do you use or can you use also a bit mask instead of a single number for the pol filtering policies? More the implementation question. Yeah. So well, if we remove the filtering policies, um, we don't have to think. Uh, um, otherwise, how to do that? But um, yeah, I agree. It could have been implemented with a bit mask. Thanks. Uh, and <clears throat> next on the list is Jim Reed. Thanks, guys. Um, I'd rather really agree with the points that Ben did a few minutes ago, and I'd like to go back to one of the points that Eric made because I think that's also very well made. And my question to you, Daniel, is why did you choose to go for an EDNS option rather than a dedicated resource record type? Would that not be a better option all around, assuming this thing was to go forward? And maybe that resource record type might be the best info thing. So um, the, the question to why did I use uh, the EDNS zero? Um, it's, um, well, it was mostly because I, I saw that a lot of information um were provided through edns zero option um it's not that i am i was not open to um any other things i i thought that i mean it, we had already experience in that field so um i wanted to benefit from this experience but um i'm happy to just to take a other means more appropriate thanks Okay, so I think that's it for this queue. Um, and um, oh, is Eric back? Uh, perhaps. Does this work? Now it does. Uh, okay, thank you. I apologize. It seems like WebEx told me I was unmuted, but then it also did not tell me that I could not find a mic. So I was both unmuted and micless. Uh, I think. Um, most of uh, the things I wanted to say, others said more eloquently. Uh, I just wanted to also note that I, I, I'm a little skeptical of the ultimate usefulness of some of all of this, um, because I think we could easily end up in a lot of different scenarios, one of which is where all resolvers announce that they do filtering, because all resolvers and all clients are in some jurisdiction somewhere. And just by virtue of being in a jurisdiction, <laughs> you know, all governments may have you know, we may end up in a world where there, there are just a legal minefield of policies. And so uh, it's not clear to me that there, that there, there could be a useful signal at the end of all of this. That was all, sorry. Also things like, you know, if he, if somebody passes a law about uh, their, 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 their filtering policies uh, apply to their citizens wherever they travel throughout the world, then you need to know the citizenship of the person who's making the query or who owns the device. It, uh, I, I, I have some, some, some skepticism in this area. Thanks. So I do understand um, there are two things. Some, uh, some filter, I mean, um, and it's a, it really depends what we want to advertise or the meeting the meaning of that bit or maybe value we want to advertise but it it's true that um, legal enforcement force you to implement some kind of filtering um, and those depends to the jurisdictions the resolver is um, but it's a 
it's not the same type of filtering that we expect for, um, um, when we subscribe to um, a filtering mechanism based on uh, uh, anti-malware uh, detection or um, um, filtering adult content. Um, so, yeah, so we, we have to it's, be clear. It's a, it's a voluntary filtering that the resolver is doing on its own, not as mandated. So, okay, so the, the illegal bit also, I guess, doesn't make sense then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By, defini by definition, that's what you're bit. saying, but the illegal bit is implied at all times. So, it's um, yeah. It, it really depends what you. I mean, what I meant meant by illegal is um, content that are not um, that are illegal, but in nature directions. But I, uh, I mean, the words behind the, um, um, I mean, I I, I I I mostly wanted to express some different ways to do filtering, and whether it might be useful to to have those different categories. Um, but um, my understanding is that it, it, it's not it's not useful to go I into the detail. So um, having a single bit saying we do filtering, and in which case it's going to be filtering um, being performed by the resolver in addition to um, what is jurisdiction is uh, asking to do. Understood. Thanks. All right, thank you, Daniel. Um, I think that wraps everything up for for this session. So even though I said we were, I thought we were going to end early, we are basically ending on time. The um, the two call for adoptions are out on the mailing list: uh, one for the DNS over quick and one for the early data draft. Uh, so please voice your opinions there on on, on those two calls. Uh, one final reminder for everyone to go sign the blue sheet. Uh, the link is both in the Jabber room and in the ether in the um, WebEx chat. So without that, I think I want to wrap everything up. Thanks everybody for, for joining us and we will see you soon, hopefully. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Bye.